Welcome to my economics channel, where I love discussing the topic, but most importantly, I love to make something fun and interesting to learn. And in today's episode, I actually have part two of a series that I'm making on EE's video titled, Are the Extreme Economic Systems Totally Pointless? And what I'm doing is making shorter, more concise videos and breaking down his claims into a bit more detail than I normally would do, especially in some of my videos, which were 20 or 30 minutes, which I think might've been a bit too long uh, to go through in one sitting. And actually just a quick note before I get into the video, I had decided to break up this video into two parts and I'm re-recording this intro. And that's why I'll be wearing a different shirt for the outro for this video, because that had already been recorded. So with that out of the way, let's get into the video. You see, the world in the 1800s was getting wealthier. Steam power, railroads, telegrams, all enabled business to be done and wealth to be created on a scale that would have been unimaginable some 100 years earlier. But all the while, living conditions had not improved for average workers, and in pollution-filled cities lined with soul-crushing factories, they had probably gone backwards. This was because average workers did not control the means of production. Land, labour and capital is what is needed to make anything. It's a very large stretch to say that all of this was caused because people didn't own the means of production. It should be noted that as machinery became more commonplace, the dangerous working conditions were well recognised and that women and children were soon barred from the factory work. Whilst we cannot read the minds of people making the laws at the time, they certainly do seem to have been paternalistically minded when campaigning for and constructing these laws. There is also good evidence that people got additional pay to compensate them for the dangerous working conditions. And so it seems that people were making rational decisions based on the incentives on offer. So in terms of owning the means to production, that's essentially worker cooperative. So let's look at them in some detail. To join a cooperative, eligible workers must purchase an initial share. The price can be very low in some industries that don't need very large capital investments. However, shares can be far more expensive. For example, in Isthmus Engineering, a worker cooperative based in Madison, Wisconsin, a share can cost up to $10,000. Workers share in the profits based on how much labor they put into the firm, rather than investment. This share can be determined by the number of hours worked, by earnings, or by a combination of the two. In addition, people who have been there longer can get a larger share of the profits. So let's look at the performance of modern worker cooperatives. Perotin, or Periton, I'm not sure how to say it exactly, sorry about that, quote, worker cooperatives are never found to be less productive than conventional firms and may be more productive. That seems conclusive enough, but there's more nuance to the story of production as we get, quote, if conventional firms organize production in the same way as cooperatives, they might produce more with their current average input levels in these industries. Arts and Yan Yan, uh, once again, sorry for butchering that, found that cooperatives had lower quit rates relative to similar conventional firms. Worker cooperatives adjust pay rather than firing people during downturns, so that cooperative members bear financial risk rather than employment risk. The success of the cooperative really depends on whether workers have much say in the governance of the firm. On page 941, Molk concludes by saying, quote, Cooperatives have lower failure rates than comparable investor-owned rivals after controlling for a variety of factors such as firm size, age, and industry. So those are the benefits. What about the drawbacks of cooperatives? Cooperatives can face chronic underinvestment in the firm, which may favor short-term projects. There might be a tendency to not want to grow the firm since this dilutes a person's share in the firm. There can be a temptation to sell out to owners in order to cash out the investment in the firm which can't be realized any other way. And so on page 22, Perotin concludes that, a common pattern amongst such companies is that after a few years, especially if the firm is successful, worker members sell out the company to a conventional owner. If you're planning on leaving a cooperative sometime soon, you will not want funds diverted from your share in the business to go into either long-term projects or machinery maintenance. You will not see the benefits that these projects will bring. Okay, so clearly there are far more benefits than drawbacks to cooperatives. So why aren't there more worker cooperatives? And from EE's quote, why weren't they more of a thing during the Industrial Revolution? From Molk, we understand they are relatively difficult to form because entrepreneurs don't get much personally out of starting a cooperative. There can be difficulty in managing worker cohesion, especially if the workers are heterogeneous, as in they come from different backgrounds and they're generally just very different people, and because of inefficient distribution amongst members. 
there can be difficulty attracting entrepreneurial talent and insufficient rewards for high ability workers. Cooperatives also face higher costs because the firm predominantly gets investment only from its members. There's very little outside investment. It is found that workers essentially sort themselves by ability when joining cooperatives. And so joining or starting a cooperative is not always a straightforward and simple process. It can certainly be a more difficult process than going to an interview and getting hired at a traditional firm, even as annoying as this process can be, uh, something which I know from personal experience. Most cooperatives tend to be small as concentration at the top by managers can't happen if each person has an equal say in what happens in the business. But this small size means that cooperatives won't necessarily hire more people as quickly as a corresponding traditional business. The same managers in cooperatives tend to have less oversight, which can harm the overall efficiency of the business, and which of course undermines the entire point of a cooperative. Managers will often want higher wages than those earned by other members, and those members may not accept the wage difference. The most successful worker cooperatives, such as Mondragon, have restricted worker control by delegating authority to elected boards. And as a historical example of this, crew members and boat owners in the 19th century whaling industry held shares in the profits from a successful voyage, but the captain made the decisions at the sea, not the shareholders. Okay, so let's look at what kind of person starts a cooperative. Who is this entrepreneur? Most cooperatives form from the initiative of a single entrepreneur, and that person requires a different attitude to a normal entrepreneur looking to start a business. As such people are rarer, cooperatives are similarly rarer. Also, converting a firm into a cooperative is costly, even if at the individual level there might be benefits to doing so. From Molk, we learn that entrepreneurs desire wealth and autonomy as the primary reason for starting a business, and quote, with society-orientated measures of pursuing a personal vision, status, respect, or concern for the community a distant secondary importance. Entrepreneurs are not incentivized to start a business as a cooperative because they cannot take an outsized profit share from the business if it's successful. And yet, because the failure rate for new businesses is so high, it must be possible to get such profits to act as an incentive in the first place. Quote, in this way, starting a cooperative is analogous to supplying a public good. The entrepreneur must share the profits from ownership amongst the other member owners. And so from the evidence, we get that even when cooperatives would be the efficient form for a particular business, they won't form due to the difficulties involved. And so how do we wrap all of this up? What does all of this have to say for the workers in the 18th and 19th centuries? So cooperatives are hard to start nowadays, let alone in the 19th century. It simply was not realistic for more worker cooperatives to exist. Even though some did exist, they were mostly smaller firms and actually these cooperatives did exist in the manufacturing industry. But the poor working conditions of the time were a recognized problem and they were over time, albeit very slowly, ameliorated. They were made better. However, based on the evidence that I've seen and indeed what I've shown, I do not believe if there had been more worker cooperatives that these working conditions would have improved much faster. As I've shown, worker cooperatives expand much slower and what we see from the evidence is that factories expanded very quickly and a lot of people worked in factory conditions. So this does imply that the first generations of the Industrial Revolution had to suffer for progress to go ahead and I'm not entirely sure what to say about that. But that is what happened. If we had simply had more worker cooperatives, I do not believe we would see the benefits that we're seeing today. Progress would not have been made quite as quickly and it might have been the case that because not as many people were working in these really poor working conditions, there might in fact not have been such a push to improve their working condition. So it goes without saying that it's easy for me to say as an academic exercise that people had to go through such conditions in order for us to get to the modern world. And that was only because so many people were employed in the factory system and eventually, slowly over time, factory conditions did indeed improve. And I was not personally affected by such conditions, and of course I don't know anyone who was. But with all of that out of the way, what I want to point out is that the story that EE e. paints is far, far too simple. So that's the reason why I've gone into such detail into the claims made so far. The claims made fit a popular narrative that we have of history, but history is so much more exciting, so much more interesting when you learn what actually happened, and when we try to get into the lives of the people back then, and we look at the economic realities involved. So that's all I have to say for this video. 
If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask below and I'll do my best to answer or I'll put the questions into another video and I'll answer it there. So, thank you for watching, subscribe, rate and share, also hit that bell notification because that also helps me, and I'll see you guys in the next video in this series.